So for this close reading, I want to start just by focusing right on the very beginning of the story. So that is page 433, lines 1 through about 11. And I just want to think about what this text is leading us toward, what it might be saying right away, and again, talk about that present tense usage and how that might be significant. So I'm just going to read it out loud first, and then you can follow along. Quick note, if you, again, like listening to the audio instead of just uh, reading it by yourself, on all of your online textbooks, it has a button that you can click to listen to the audio. If you look in the left side of the text uh, and you see a little speaker, if you click that on every page, it'll have an audio version of it. So if that's helpful to you, please use it. Okay. Tom is born in 1914 Detroit. Mm -hmm. Great name. A quarter mile from International Salt. His father is off stage, unaccounted for. His mother operates a six-room, under-insulated boarding house populated with locked doors behind which drowse the grim possessions of itinerant salt workers. Coats the color of mice, tattooed mucking boots, aquatints of undressed women, their breasts faded orange. Every six months, a miner is fired or drafted or dies and is replaced by another, so that very early on in his life, Tom comes to see how the world continually drains itself of young men, leaving behind only objects, empty tobacco pouches, bladeless jackknives, salt-caked trousers, mute, incapable of memory. All right, so this starts off strong, which is why I wanted to uh, start with the beginning of the text here. So first of all, uh, what do we know? 1914 is the beginning of a major world event, you might remember, World War I. Uh, and so that's why a little bit later it says that men are leaving because they are drafted into service is what that means there. Um, and also International Salt is a salt mining company uh, that you might, you know, you might have inferred that. You might also know about salt mines, that they are sort of just kind of colloquially known as one of the hardest, worst jobs that uh, people can do. And, and, and very often people who live in poverty, as we can see through the rest of this, will do that sort of a job because, you know, maybe they're unskilled, maybe they don't have education, uh, and maybe they just don't have any other options to them. And so that's where we begin in the salt mines in Detroit. Um, moving forward, we see his father is off stage, unaccounted for. I think this is a really interesting way to describe how the father is absent from the scene, right? So literally off stage would mean he's out of the audience's view on a stage, but um, we're not off stage here. And so it kind of immediately makes me think of his whole life almost not as a performance, but as a, I don't know, a performance in the sense, I guess, that that we are watching it. Um, but absent from his life. Anyway, his mother operates a six-room, under-insulated boarding house populated with locked doors behind which growls and grim <laughs> That sentence is so long. And what's interesting about that sentence is you run out of breath, and it gives you the same sense that maybe his mother and him feel of just constantly being behind and constantly struggling uh, to get through something. Um, under-insulated means it's constantly cold. It gets very, very cold in Detroit uh, in the winter. And that the grim possessions of itinerant salt workers drowse there. Uh, this isn't a very happy place, right? Coats the color of mice, so brown. Everything's brown and gray. Even the women's bodies are, are fading to orange. Uh, not very colorful uh, world that they are living in. Um, and there's constant turnover here, right? Every six months, a miner is fired or drafted or dies and is replaced by another. It's really interesting to me how fired, drafted, and die are all, they're all mentioned together as though they are equivalent. Although dying is obviously quite different from being fired and quite different from, from being drafted. Because ultimately the end result is the same, right? They're gone. And uh, for Tom and for his mom and, and for, you know, generally everybody else, that that is the same outcome kind of shows how brutal the world that they live in is as well. Um, you know, that you would equi make, make equivalent death in being fired uh, also kind of shows, you know, the, the precarious state that they are in. Because if they're fired, that might mean that they are going to go die because they don't have the money to feed themselves. So they're in a pretty rough situation. 
Tom comes to see how the world continually drains itself of young men, leaving behind only objects. Empty tobacco pouches, bladeless jackknives, salt cake trousers, mute and capable of memory. And so this point, kind of showing how, at least for, for especially uh, young men in poverty, the world burns through them, right? Those are the men that are going to be on the front lines in a war. Those are the men who are going to take the challenging jobs uh, where death is imminent and possible. Um, and they leave behind objects that are mute and incapable of memory, right? We remember, people remember, but things don't. Things don't have memory attached to them. And these are just random things, right? Uh, a tobacco pouch, a, jack, a bladeless jackknife, salt cake trousers, that's it. They, they don't necessarily speak to any sort of individuality. It actually makes me think of, of Mice and Men when we first see Lenny and George go into the bunkhouse uh, for the first time and they see just some of the objects that some of the people have left behind. And that same sort of idea of this constant turnover of people uh, happens in that story as well. Perhaps unsurprisingly, because they're both dealing with people who are living in, in abject poverty. Okay, so that's the first paragraph. I really want you to try. I'm, I'm not giving you a lot to read every single day. I'm not giving you a lot to answer. And so I really want you to take your time and dig into these chunks as much as you can. Um, you know, you don't have to spend seven minutes on every paragraph like I have here. But I really do want you to do your best to... Don't just let the words fly by your eyes. Really use the skills that you have built, oh, I mean, over this year, but really over all four years of your high school and, and all the time that you've been reading, really try and dig into what this author is doing and how he's achieving his purpose. Okay, see you in part two.